When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Rosetta Stone is the language learning program with a lasting impact. I've been using their app to learn French, and it's not just about memorizing words, but actually having real conversations. And it's not just French. They offer 25 languages. Right now, Rosetta Stone has an awesome holiday deal, 50% off their lifetime membership. Every language, unlimited access forever. For anyone keen on diving deep into a new language, check out rosettastone.com. It's a game changer. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a guy that, just like Michael Scott, he knows that St. Patrick's Day is the closest thing the Irish have to Christmas. He is our beloved captain. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening, and thanks for telling a friend. This week we are featuring tangerine wheat by the good folks at Lost Coast Brewing. Tangerine wheat is brewed with the perfect balance of wheat and crystal malts. Tangerine wheat delivers a perfectly crisp finish. It's got a good citrus kick to it. Garage grade four and a quarter bottle caps out of five. And we got beer in the fridge because of these great garage friends. So let's give thanks and cheers to the following. First up, cheers to Cassandra up in Ottawa, Canada. And a big shout out to Shiloh in Farmington, Connecticut. Next up, here's a cheers to Lydia in Knoxville, Tennessee. And a big We Like Your Jib to Melissa in Dallas, Oregon. And cheers to Sheldon in Manitoba, Canada. And a big thanks and cheers to Mitchell from Calgary, Canada. Everyone we just mentioned went to truecrimegarage.com and kicked in for this week's beer fund. And for that, we thank you. And if you'd like to give us a little change, a little cash, a little good day, governor, then go to the webpage, Click on the donate button. But we also have koozies and coffee mugs and t-shirts for sale. So if you want to give us a little love and get something in return, go to the store page. And that is enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Danny Hohenstein was just six years old, and he was last seen playing with a dog near his home in the afternoon hours of December 1st, 1992. His mother, Jackie, was inside preparing a meal for the boy. When she went to call him in, Danny was nowhere to be found. Eventually, she called the police, and the search for Danny began. After the case went cold, about a year into the investigation, the FBI joined forces with the local detective. We have been talking with Special Agent Jeffrey Reinick, a 30-year FBI agent who assisted in the search for Danny Hohenstein. And as you guys are doing your investigation, you're actually going to get a tip or a lead from Danny's sister, Shannon. I learned from the FBI. The FBI was doing training, and because I was working these cases, I was being sent for in-service training, and I was learning about the profiling stuff, although I was not a profiler at this time. 
one thing that the FBI drove home to us was that a lot of times a person may have knowledge and not be aware of that knowledge, especially a family member. So Vernie and I were constantly telling Jackie and Shannon to think of anything and to add some, I'm a practical joker. I, I love humor. I live on humor. And I, 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 I you know, you, I'm sure you can edit this out, but I said to Shannon, Shannon, if you have a fart that comes out the wrong cheek, you call us about it. We want to know what happened. Mm -hmm, right. And sure enough, at some point she called me and she said that her mother had a friend and her friend had a son who was um, charged or, or associated with assaults on children. And she wondered if her mother's friend's son would have any uh, meaning to Danny's disappearance. And so Vern and I, we started working this up. I couldn't find the kid at all. He was a kid too. He was, he was uh, in California, the governor, I forget the governor's name, but at one point in California, before I got here, I think it was like in 19, early 1990s, the California uh, governor enacted something that caused a lot of people in the mental institutions to be released. This boy that Shannon was talking about was one of those people. He had been in a mental institution and then he was released. And because he was a minor, his records were sealed. And I could not even identify a record that indicated he was alive. Vern, on the other hand, through his contacts and through his work, and because he is so amazingly good, he found him. He found the boy. And we didn't use his name in the book because he wasn't charged. So um, I forget what name we used for him in the book, but Vern found him, Jonathan. And we started working up Jonathan. I started working up Jonathan from my angle. He started working up Jonathan from his angle. And what we learned is that Jonathan mm -hmm. had recently been taken into custody because he had assaulted a six-year-old boy on a school bus. And there was a time before that where Jonathan had assaulted a young six- or seven-year-old boy near some dumpsters in the apartments where he lived. And so we were very interested. And Vern and I both, uh, mm -hmm. we realized that Jonathan was in one of the state facilities for developmentally delayed children. And so we started making inquiries. And, and Nick, it was unbelievable. We could not get any information, even in a situation like this, where it was, we had a six year old boy missing, the, the state would give us nothing. So Vern and I, we found one of the workers, an investigator, and we, we both went there personally and just begged for help. And this investigator helped us. And we learned that Jonathan had an extensive history of this and that Jonathan was currently in the state hospital he was originally at. And she arranged for us to go down and meet him and talk to him. And at the time, he was 17. I mean, doesn't this feel like a got him moment? Got him. Well, and the interesting thing about this information that comes to Special Agent Reinick, they're actually years into the investigation. Danny has been missing for years by this point, by the time they track down Jonathan, right. who's now 17 years old, living in a state hospital. But the other interesting angle about this information, not only does Jonathan have a history of assaulting other children and children younger than him, mm -hmm. Jonathan lived with his mother, Diana, around the time that Danny went missing. Right. And the two of them lived near, somewhat near Danny and Danny's mother, Jackie. Right. And just when you hear them talk about how he attacked the six-year-old boy that lived by him by a dumpster, you go, well... Is this the same thing? 
it's not too far of a leap right. from what possibly could have happened regarding Danny in his situation. Danny would have been about the same age as these other two boys that were assaulted by this this older boy. So you and your partner now have contact, and now you're going to go to the mental institution to question him. And we invited his doctor to stay in the interview with us because we felt uh, if he said something to the doctor, there wouldn't be an expectation of privilege since we were there. We sat with him and started talking to him. And he said he knew Danny. And he was talking about Danny, the Danny that he knew. And Vern had a picture of Danny that was taken in a group before Danny had the scabies. And so he had long hair. And he showed that picture to Jonathan. And Jonathan said, oh, that's Danny. And that's the way he looks now. Wow. That's strange. Now, I could not have picked Danny out from that picture. And Vern got real red-faced because at the time Danny disappeared, or, or I'm sorry, before Danny disappeared, he would have had the long hair. And that's exactly how he would have looked. So we started concentrating on Jonathan, and we took a statement from Jonathan. Mm -hmm. And Jonathan told us that, he and his mother knew Danny and went to Danny's house frequently. And then he would play with Danny in Danny's room where Danny had a video game. And this is all accurate. And Vern knew to a greater degree than I did because he had drilled down to the details. And the two of us, you could just feel a ball of electricity in your stomach start to rise. And he says that they were driving past Danny's house one day, which would have been the day he disappeared. And they saw Danny in front of his house and they stopped and picked him up and Danny went with them. And then they went to a park and <clears throat> at the park, Danny had to go to the bathroom and Jonathan said he went with him and he hurt Danny. We believe that he's telling us that he assaulted him and might have you know, killed him. So this is just, it's just unbelievable what's going on. At the time this is happening, I'm in my mid-40s, and Vern is about 20 years older than me. He's about 65. And we finished our interview with Jonathan, and we decided to head right up back to Megalia from down near L.A. where we were. And I remember... The two of us, I mean, between the excitement and the exhaustion, we eventually had to stop and we got a room and slept for a few hours and then continued back up to Miguelia. We found Jackie and asked Jackie about this boy's mother. And Jackie knew the mother, but said she had never met the boy. And so we asked her to explain to us how he knew the layout so well. And of course, she couldn't. And then we talked to Danny's sister, and Danny's sister explained to us that, you know, the mom may not want to talk about it if she realizes what might have happened. And then we found Jonathan's mother. Dun, dun, dun. And we ended up polygraphing Jonathan's mother. And, of course, she did not do too well. The statement that Jonathan had given us could not be used because he had a very low IQ. He was not aware of good and bad. He did not know that what he might have done to Danny was bad. And we didn't even know if we could rely on what he said because he had such a low level of intellect. So I remember I called back to the FBI's uh, behavioral science unit and I asked them for guidance. A guy named Roy Hazelwood said to me that you just have to keep going back and eventually there will be consistencies that you can pick out. Vernon and I ended up going back about eight or nine times. And, and just like we were told, there were consistencies. Another thing that we learned was we were able to talk to the people at the facility and learn about the relationship between Jonathan and his mother. 
Jonathan, at six years of age, had been sexually assaulted by a boyfriend of his mother. And since that time, he started acting out sexually, and he was acting out with other boys and men sexually. So his mother, in the hope of bringing Jonathan back to being the way he should be, started having a sexual relationship with Jonathan. So Jonathan and his mother start engaging in a regular behavior of having sex. One, this is where the story gets pretty twisted. Yeah. So just just a quick recap for myself here. So I know that uh, where we're where we're at in this stage. Mm -hmm. Danny goes missing, six years old, missing for a few years before this lead from Danny's older sister Shannon falls to Agent Reinick and his partner, Vern Kelch. They follow up on this lead. They've had other good leads, leads right. that they thought were good. And they follow up on this lead, even tracking down this boy where it's almost impossible to track him down because the state won't provide any information regarding this kid because he's only 17 by this point. Right, but when they get in contact with him, they get a confession pretty quickly. Very quickly. Yes, he's he's pretty much honest. And after seeing a picture or two of Danny, the weird statement is this is how Danny looks now mm. coming from Jonathan. Mm -hmm. And then you also find out that to dig a little deeper that this boy himself now at the age of 17, he's causing problems and has been for years. But he initially is a, a victim himself. Of right. molestation. Well, and he has a low IQ, and then you have to, you know, is he saying, is this, this, this is what he looks like now, and is that just because he's mixing up present tense and past tense, you know what I mean? Like, is it something where it's like, well, this is what he looks like now, or d did he mean that's what he looked like back then? Uh, because, he, like, like they said, he has a pretty low IQ. It might also be some indication of his comprehension of, of what is has actually taken place. Right. So, but, but then <clears throat> the fact that we, you know, we have these detectives that interview the mother, she does bad on the polygraph test. Now you start wondering, did her son do something bad? And is she covering up for her son? The other thing that I want to point out here, and this is not super clear in our interview portion, but when Jonathan, the boy at the hospital states that he had gone to Danny's home and played a game, a video game with Danny in his room. Because yeah. you have these situations mm -hmm. where when you have investigators interviewing someone, especially in this particular situation, you wonder, could they be feeding information? Could there, could this be a bad interview? Could this be a bad confession? Maybe mm -hmm. this kid doesn't fully comprehend the questions he's being asked. Well, and it's sad, too, because with Danny's mother, she doesn't even know how this other boy would know anything about their house. But we, we also know that she's very neglectful of her son. I mean, to the point where, yes, I mean, when you have to shave your kid's head to try to get the, you know, some kind of healthy hygiene system going because you neglected them so bad. That's pretty awful. Yeah. The, but this is a little bit of truth and information. I believe in what Jonathan's statement is to the FBI and to the local detective. Mm -hmm. When he says that he had been in Don, Danny's home and played a video game with Danny in his room. That's interesting to me because that's something that only someone who had actually been there would know. That was one of the things that the investigators knew about Danny, that he he had very little in the way of possessions, as we stated, he was neglected. But one of the things that he held dear was he had like a Nintendo video game. Right. And that was in his room. And that was something that he probably spent a lot of time playing at night when his mother was not around. Right. So it's kind of his babysitter. This is your breadcrumb. If you're the investigator to know that, hey, there's there might be some truth in what this young man, Jonathan, who's only 17, is telling us. We learned that Jonathan and his mother would go to the bathroom together and they were caught several times having sex. And so this just all 
it was almost all too much. But at the same time, um, we felt like we had something we could work with that we could try and work up as what happened to Danny. In the process of talking to him, Jonathan described that after he hurt Danny in the bathroom, his mother came in and checked Danny and said Danny was not alive anymore. And they took Danny's body back to his mother's car and they tried to find a place to leave Danny. And and Jonathan said to leave Danny to sleep. He said that uh, one of the times they were doing this, they ran into other people who had flashlights who were calling out to them. Well, Verl went back and reviewed the search and rescue records and found that at one of the points in the search, a couple of the uh, rescue workers came upon a strange vehicle in the woods. And when they called out to the occupants, the people got back in the car and drove away. And this was right in the area of where they were looking for Danny. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot, and it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapist at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. Rosetta Stone is the language learning program with a lasting impact. I've been using their app to learn French, and it's not just about memorizing words, but actually having real conversations. And it's not just French. They offer 25 languages. Right now, Rosetta Stone has an awesome holiday deal, 50% off their lifetime membership. Every language, unlimited access forever. For anyone keen on diving deep into a new language, check out rosettastone.com. It's a game changer. The Angie's List you know and trust is now Angie, and we're so much more than just a list. We still connect you with top local pros and show you ratings and reviews, but now we also let you compare upfront prices on hundreds of projects and book a service instantly. We can even handle the rest of your project from start to finish. So remember, Angie's List is now Angie, and we're here to get your job done right. Get started at Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I, or download the app today. Then we learn from Danny's mother that uh, where where, uh, Jonathan's mother lived, and we went there. And when we went there, we found in the backyard there was what could be best described as a shrine. And in the shrine, which was to a little boy, there were keys in a plate. Nothing but our guts, which isn't enough. We learned from the shrine and from talking to Jonathan that Danny's body was placed in that car. And this was the time when there was the explosion of forensic science and they were doing mitochondrial DNA and trace evidence. And we, the FBI had just started up these evidence teams called evidence response teams. And we got the Sacramento evidence response team We found the car that had belonged to Jonathan's mother, and we took the evidence, uh, or we went, um, a guy from our office, our fleet guy named Ralph Lux, he went and we got a search warrant for the car, and we took the car, and we took the car back to our Sacramento office. 
And there, our evidence response team went through the car and they recovered all the trace evidence from the trunk and back seat and all that. There was nothing that would flag this as a big development. And they sent the uh, trace evidence into the FBI laboratory and they were working on it. I was in contact with them. And then in 1998, hikers in the area of where Danny had disappeared came upon a skull. And the skull taken to the um, California State University, Chico, that had an unbelievable forensic anthropology department. And they had developed special software that let them superimpose the skull onto a picture of Danny. And it fit. So we began to think that this was Danny's skull. I was in touch with the FBI laboratory, the DNA, with a, uh, his name was uh, Jonathan Jeb Stewart, and he was working mitochondrial DNA. And I was trying to get him to look for DNA in the trace evidence recovered from the car. The FBI lab was really busy at the time, and they, they didn't have enough time or resources to go through every little thing that was found. So he said, I sent him a picture of Danny, and he picked out a few of the hairs that could be construed or could be considered as part of Danny, and he did mitochondrial DNA examinations on that. The mitochondrial DNA, unlike nuclear DNA, that's a DNA we get from our mother. And it won't give us a unique person identification, like you can't sit there on the stand and say, oh, this DNA matched this person and therefore it's him. It tells you that the person you have is an offspring of a certain woman. And so the best we could do was to say that the trace evidence recovered from the car belonged to the person who was an offspring of a woman. And the, they did the my, mitochondrial DNA testing on the hairs. And because Danny's remains were being recovered, they, uh, they had a leg bone that they can compare it to. And I remember I got a call one day from Jeb, and he says, um, it's the same mitochondrial DNA between the hair, the leg bone, and Jackie. And as I'm telling you this, Nick, now, I mean, I feel myself welling up. I couldn't believe it. And then uh, I, I thanked them. And then I hung up and I tried to compose myself. And I called Vern. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> I said, Vern, are you sitting down? And he, you know, he's like, yeah, I'm sitting down. I said, Vern, I just got a call from the lab. And they said that the mitochondrial DNA from the leg bone that was recovered and the hair that was in the car comes from Jackie. And since we knew where Jackie's other offspring were, we could say that it was Danny. And I said, Vern, it's mm -hmm. him. And um, just like I'm about to do with you, he started um, not being able to talk. And he, I heard a lot of sighing. And he said, look, I'll call you back in a few minutes. And he hung up. And I think the two of us were each sitting at each phone crying. And then he called me back. And, um, you know, we just, we, just, we just tried to accept the reality that we had found him. And we found out what happened to him. Of course, the next step would be to prosecute Jonathan for what he had done and his mother. But the reality mm -hmm. was... Jonathan believed that when he left Danny in the woods, he left him sleeping. He did not know the concept of death versus life, and he didn't know the concept of good and bad. So he couldn't even understand what he had done. And this meant that he would never be competent to stand trial. And because Jonathan's mother <clears throat> was an accessory, mm -hmm. the statute on that had expired already. So uh, Jonathan was never prosecuted, but the prosecutor sits with the files in his office. And if they ever decide in California to let these people out of the, the mental hospitals again, then they'll prosecute 
uh, Jonathan for what he did. Well, some of the things that I find interesting regarding the interaction between you and Jonathan and in his statements during the course of your interview process is that he's able to accurately describe a few things that you have to believe that only the person possibly responsible for his disappearance would be able to describe. And part of that is the shirt that Danny was wearing on the day that he went missing. He also references a Nintendo game inside of Danny's home. He also accurately states that Danny had two different hairstyles, two different haircuts, longer hair and then the buzz cut at the time of the disappearance. What was the importance of the scabies that we discussed earlier regarding this case? Well, the important role of the scabies was that at the time Danny disappeared, he had this shaven head. Jonathan said to us, and I, pro- I probably left this out, that when he looked at the picture, he said the, that was the way Danny used to look, but not the way Danny looks now. And and I don't think I explained that well because, uh, but that was the, the importance of the scabies was to give us the ability to know that he had seen Danny in two different um, postures of appearance. And on top of Dan Danny having scabies, that it was believed that Jonathan also had scabies around that time that Danny went missing. Yes, there was a strong indication that Jonathan also had scabies, and we believe that was related. But it's one of those things, Nick, where you have to take what you can hold best first, and everything else comes afterward and the scabies yes is a very important thing but we could not prove that jonathan had had scabies when danny disappeared now jonathan and of course that's a a a made-up name a fake name um for real person but yes to your knowledge he's still he's not out walking around on the streets no no and what was the aftermath for this murder investigation um, with Jackie and with Danny's family? This is when we get an answer like this. It was frustrating for the family because uh, Jonathan could not be prosecuted and there could not be an actual event or series of events in time that would acknowledge the information that we had learned and be able to say that Jonathan was the person who, who had done this with the assistance of his mother. But with all victims, families and Jackie was no different. They do love the ones that are missing and Jackie and Shannon and Brandon, the brother, they wanted to have a memorial for Danny. They wanted to acknowledge his existence. Believe it or not, because of the life Danny had lived, he, there was no pictures of Danny. The only picture we had of him was a picture of him at the dentist's office with that, you know, how they put that apron around your neck with the chain. And so I got a hold of that picture And I took it to our photo guys at the FBI, and I asked them if they could crop out anything that would reveal the dentist office and just give us the best picture they could. And my intent was to take that picture and for Vern and I to have it framed and for Vern and I to put a little uh, plaque at the bottom of the picture saying that um, this was for you know, Shannon from Vernon Jeff, or this is from, for Brandon from Vernon Jeff. And uh, when the FBI found out what I was doing, they actually picked up the cost of it. And our photo guys took, you know, did what they did. And, uh, and that was our way of marking it. There's a, a wonderful newspaper article where Vern and I are at Danny's memorial and Shannon, you know, hugs each one of us, calls us up and acknowledges us to the crowd, to the people that had come. And then um, Danny is buried. Jackie died 
right around that time mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, her, her lifestyle caused a premature death. And so Jackie and Danny are buried side or not. They're, they're encased side by side in a mausoleum. And, uh, Ironically, that mausoleum is right in the area where this campfire happened. So when things settle down, I, I want to drive up there and see if it's intact. Now, did you become a profiler later in your career? I did, yes. I uh, I did, and I'm very proud of that. Could you take us through the process of becoming a profiler, what that entails, and what training is involved in that? Oh, yeah, Absolutely. Let me start off by saying that right now, the profilers at the FBI, uh, they're in a unit called the National Center for the Analysis of Violent Crime. It, that's what, what it's known as now. And I've been retired now for 12 years, so that's, that's what it was when I retired. Um, it used to be the Behavioral Analysis Unit. It used to be called the... Um, Child Abduction Serial Killer Unit, CASCU. Um, it's gone through different names. But the beginning of the profiling started with John Douglas and his peers working at the FBI. And they worked on a the theory that if they went around interviewing serial killers or serial rapists or these people that have committed crimes, that they might be able to identify certain things about them that would help uh, identify other killers. So in TV now, your listeners probably see the well, they bring in the profilers and the criminal minds and all that. Criminal profiling does not give you the person who did the crime. It, it gives you the potential personal uh, picture of that person. So it's, it's, and it's based on, in my opinion, and this is my opinion, it's based on statistics. As an example, uh, one of the things I did in my career to be a better investigator was once a month, I attended law enforcement meetings where offenders, sex offenders coming out on parole agreed to be interviewed by law enforcement. And if you take that and you compare it to what John Douglas and the initial uh, mind hunters, as people like to call them, were doing, it's very similar. They were going and talking to people who were still in prison, but they were talking to them about their crimes, how they committed their crimes, why they committed their crimes, how they chose their victims, things like that. And we were doing that here in Sacramento with guys coming out on parole. You learn there are certain things that you can identify with behavior. One of the examples I love to use is that when I was attending the uh, parole interviews, they would give us a document or a briefing document that would describe what their crime was, but it would also include their criminal history. Well, I learned from going to these things, from interacting with the other guys, that a lot of these guys that commit sexual offenses will have a history of burglaries in their criminal record. We're not talking about two or three. We're talking about 10, 15, a lot of them. The question becomes, or people say, well, why are burglaries important when you consider a sexual offender? And what I learned and uh, there was another guy I worked with named Steve Hill from the Sacramento County Sheriff's Office who made so much available to me. But what I learned was that a lot of these guys, if not most of them, they're pleading out their sex crimes down to burglaries. These are guys that are going into homes. They're standing over a sleeping woman or child and they're fantasizing, doing what they're doing. And they get caught. And nobody wants to be charged as a sexual crime. So they're allowed to plea bargain it down and they get charged with a burglary. There was one guy I remember that we interviewed who had about 20 burglaries on his rap sheet. And I asked the guy, you know, oh, so 
you know, these, did you do these burglaries? He goes, oh yeah, yeah. And he was proud of it. I said, but you know, really, if you did these 20, there's what you probably did 40, right? And he goes, yeah. And uh, so if you did 40, I said, so um, what did you do with all the money? I mean, you must have really nice things at home. If you did these 40 burglaries, you've gotten several thousand dollars, not to mention the jewelry and things like that. And the guys would say, I don't have a cent to my name. So then the next question becomes logically, well, if you don't have the money and you were going into these homes, why were you going into those homes? And that's where, you know, they don't want to tell you, you know, oh, well, I was going in and I just didn't find anything, whatever. And then you're like, you remind them, you know, you're here for a reason. What did you do when you went into the home? And then they start describing what they did and how they did it. And you learn that a bunch of these guys will stand outside windows and they'll look in. We call them peeping toms. But you learn that where you have a lot of reportings of a peeping tom, sometimes you'll find that they urinated or defecated outside the window that they're looking in at. I, I don't know what the reason is or I, I don't understand the sexual motivation, but they do it. So this is an example where you know a normal or not a normal, you'll, you know a behavior that someone will do while they're doing something wrong and you can look for it and it helps you understand things. So this is an example of your understanding what motivates the person. Um, you, you take a, a sexual offender, for instance, and in my opinion, what I learned from the profiling training and from going to these meetings is that a sexual offender has a fantasy. And I'm talking about mostly guys right now. And that mostly these guys will have this fantasy in their head of what they want. Now, if it's a fantasy of doing something illegal, like a murder or a rape, they realize that their fantasy is of a behavior that is criminal. And they'll make a conscious decision not to do it. But some guys will also make a conscious decision to do it. So then what becomes important in terms of the profiling is understanding what their fantasy is. What is their fantasy? And this is where you find where, you, you, where your listeners watch the shows and they see, like with a the victim, there might be a breast that's bitten or or the victim is posed in a certain way, this is part of the offender's fantasy. And this gives you certain information about the offender. They learn statistically that most offenders that do serial murders like this, they're normally white, they're normally middle-aged, they have a very good intelligence. Some of them function normally in society and have their own families. Uh, if you look at the BTK killer, he's a great example if you read the information about BTK and what he did, you'll learn about his fantasy, but you'll also learn that he had a fantasy. In fact, I mean, he also he had a family. And I think my wife gets People magazine, and I saw recently there on the cover, there was uh, a, a headline, you know, uh, I was raised by a serial killer. And I think it's BTK, Dennis Rader's daughter, being interviewed and talking about her background. And so these, mm -hmm. this is examples of, uh, and so it also leads you to come into crime scenes and make certain, um, you know, uh, suspicions based on the crime scenes. If you go into a crime scene and the victim is posed, well, you know, you have uh, a sexual uh, fantasy guy. If you go into a crime scene and the victim, their face is covered. Well, that's a person who may or may not have known the victim. Most times, the, the killer will know the victim or have seen them before. And so these are things that all come into play when they then take this and they process it and they come out with, okay, this is what we think your fender is all about. I hope that was helpful. Jeff, we want to thank you for joining us here in the garage and discussing the missing persons case of Danny Hohenstein today. Before we wrap up, could you tell us a little bit about your book that you put out? Okay. The title of the book is In the Name of the Children. And it, of course, it's written by myself and my co-author, Marilee Strong. This book 
was not intended to be a book. My wife, Lori, who is the keystone of my life, asked me to write an accounting of myself for my sons and for the members of our family that come later. So they'll have something to have to know about me. And I sat there for several months with a laptop and I crying. And I wrote an accounting of my life as if I was speaking to my sons themselves. So if you read my book, you'll you'll get the feeling that I'm talking to you. And what I do in my book is I tell I I talk to everyone. Uh, in a way of explaining my life. I talk about my childhood, how it felt to be bullied and beat up all the time, how I felt when uh, I had my surgery and I was angry. Most importantly, working these crimes against children caused a lot of emotional damage to me. And I didn't know it at the time, but I learned that it caused a lot of emotional damage to my family. And I try and describe in the book the effect of this crimes on me and what I learned from my family and what I learned that I did to my family. I got to the point where I became a danger to myself. I became suicidal. In the book, I described two incidences where I did try and take my life. Um, but I also try and help the reader understand why I reached this point. And when I finished writing this manuscript and I gave it back to Lori to read, she believed that if we did make this a book, it might help other first responders or other investigators like me that work these cases because Lori and I are at our best when we're helping people and we thought maybe this book can help. And I can't begin to tell you, Nick, the calls and contacts I've gotten from other law enforcement and even from victims. The uh, I've been contacted by victims in other states who said that this book to, spoke to them on a level that they had never experienced before, and it had helped them. There, If uh, your readers get the book, and I recommend they do, there's a chapter named The 22, and in that chapter... There's a girl that's described who was, you know, very assaulted. And I gave the manuscript to every victim family I could find that was in the book. I would not have agreed to the publishing of the book if I didn't have the approval of the people. In this instance, we gave the book to this one girl and she got back to us few, several weeks later. She was crying and she said she was obsessively reading the chapter and over and over again. And the reason was because she never realized how I saw her. And I saw her as a warrior queen. And it made her feel better about herself. It made her, um, it, it made her understand that even though she was a victim, that she had fought her victimization and she had a lot to be proud of. And... These children in the 22, the chapter 22, my wife Lori and I are still in contact with them. We attend their weddings and their baby showers and their graduations. Uh, at one point during the case, one of them said, you know, are we just another case to you or and you're going to go away? Or And I promised them I would be there for them for the rest of my life. And Lori and I have, have made that promise and we've been living up to it. If your readers read the book, they'll see that each chapter is named after a victim. The first chapter is me. I describe myself as a victim for what I experienced from my birth defects and my cerebral palsy. And then after that, the chapters are names of the cases that I worked that provided transition in my life in terms of working these cases. The final chapter is named Lori, Joe, and Jordan, and this is my wife and my two sons. And it describes the harm I caused to them and how proud I am of them. And we are still very close as a family. Uh, Lori and I, Lori uh, retired um, 
this past year and since she's been retired, it's been the happiest time of my life. And the thoughts in my mind are still there, the post-traumatic stress, but I'm better able to deal with it because I have the love of my family and of my wife, Lori. So I think that your readers will experience what it's like to be in the head of an investigator, not only in working the case, but how the case affects them. And Captain, how about a little recommended reading? How about it? We have some highly recommended reading for you today. Pick up a copy of In the Name of the Children, an FBI agent's relentless pursuit of the nation's worst predators by Jeffrey Reinick. It's also available on audiobook. So if you're making a note, that's In the Name of the Children by Jeffrey Reinick. If you can't write that title down, just go to truecrimegarage.com and click on the recommended page, and we will have that there for you at the top of the page. Make sure you tell a friend. Make sure you tell your mother. Make sure you get everybody you know listening to The Garage so we can stick around. Until next week. Be good, be kind, and don't litter. Angie's list is now Angie, and we've heard a lot of theories about why. I thought it was an eco-move. Fewer words, less paper. No, it was so you could say it faster. No, it's to be more iconic. Must be a tech thing. But those aren't quite right. It's because now you can compare upfront prices, book a service instantly, and even get your project handled from start to finish. Sounds easy. It is, and it makes us so much more than just a list. Get started at Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I. Or download the app today.